Um, so I think with that, what I'd like to do is to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jomi Ramsey um, from the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. And um, Jomi, if you're ready, I'll hand off to you. Thank you. Share my screen. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about um, my dissertation research. So um, HICAS gave us some funding to investigate whether nasal swabs could be used as a biomonitoring tool for extrathoracic particulate matter exposure. So um, I'm just gonna quickly go over some background and then let you know what we did for our study. So inhalation, as I'm sure everyone knows, is the primary route of exposure for a variety of hazardous substances and the nose and the mouth are the first to encounter inhaled particles, the last to encounter exhaled particles and due to their physiologic functions of conditioning air before it reaches the lungs, they can serve as both an access point and a target for toxic effects from that particulate matter, including through olfactory transport of nanoparticles and serving as a gateway to the thoracic airway. Um, exposure to this particulate matter is associated with adverse out health outcomes depending on the type of particulate they're exposed to and the duration, rate, and frequency of exposure. So outcomes can be relatively mild, ranging from like irritation and allergies up to fairly severe, including development of nasal and sinonasal cancers. So for this project, we were interested in whether nasal swabs could be used as a biomonitoring tool to get a better handle on extrathoracic exposure. So as I'm sure with COVID, everyone's heard a lot more about nasal swabs than they probably had before all of this started. And just as a clarification, nasal swabs and nasopharyngeal swabs are pretty different. So the little picture there that's on the right shows a nasopharyngeal swab that's going to have a much deeper penetration. And those are the ones that are really uncomfortable to administer. Um, nasal swabs only go into the top of the nose and they have a lot less patient or subject discomfort. And as a benefit over nasal lavage, which is what's currently used, they don't have the potential to wash hazardous material deeper into the nasal cavity. When they have been used in occupational settings, they've primarily been used as a screening tool. So they're pretty, not common, but they're used following accidental radiation exposure. And there's been one study where they were looking at occupations with exposure to airborne gluten. But there haven't been any studies evaluating the link between exposure and nasal swab levels and no comparison of nasal swabs with nasal lavage. So this study was an experimental study. We built a recirculating aerosol wind tunnel so that we could create a controlled exposure ex environment. So there's a picture of the wind tunnel at the bottom of the slide. Um, you can see here's where the test chamber is. Uh, particles are injected right here above the fan and air circulates around the wind tunnel that way. And then we also used a physical nasal cavity model, which is shown right here. And that was generated using a CT scan of an 18 year old male with normal nasal anatomy, and it could be connected to a breathing machine. So here's just a quick cartoon of the experimental setup. We had the nasal cavity model sitting on a platform at the midline of the wind tunnel, and it was connected to a breathing machine, both inhaled and exhaled air passed through the nasal cavity. And then we monitored particulate concentration directly upstream of the nasal cavity. And then we um, monitored particulate matter um, directly downstream in the inhaled airstream of the nasal cavity before they're recirculated back to be exhaled. And that was done using um, a GRIM, which is a direct read particle count instrument. And it gave size fractions from 0.25 micrometers up to 32 micrometers in uh, 31 size bins. So for exposure conditions, we used a hematite powder um, that has a nominal particle size from zero to 10 micrometers in diameter. And we varied exposure parameters to try to represent some environmental and occupational ranges. So we kept with like moderate and indoor air and outdoor air speeds, so one to two meter per second. And then we used a solid aerosol generator, which I'll just refer to as the SAG from here on to generate the aerosol. And so that just due to the small size of the wind tunnel and the recirculating nature, we ran on its two lowest belt speed settings, so 0.1 to 0.2 percent of the maximum, and that's been shown that as the it, the concentration linearly increases with the belt speed. 
And then for ventilation, we went with a light intensity ventilation rate, so 12 breaths per minute at 0.5 liters per breath. And that's because our nasal cavity model doesn't have a mouth, so you only see nasal-only breathing at relatively light activity levels. And the nasal cavity was exposed for 15 minutes in each experiment. The clearance half-life for the nose is around 30 minutes, so we wanted to make sure we weren't butting up against when particles would start to be cleared. So we did both nasal lavage and nasal swab samples. So nasal lavage um, is just basically rinsing of the nasal cavity. So the model is split into three internal sections for ease of cleaning, but the internal sections don't have any physiologic relevance. So we just combined the rinses from the internal section and left the rinse from the nose separate so that we could see this would be the area that would be captured by nasal swab versus the internal part, which wouldn't be reached by a nasal swab. So each section was rinsed with 10 mils of DI water, and then a 10 mil aliquot was taken from the combined internal sections and repeat, repeated this three times to see whether um, we were collecting all of the matter from the nasal cavity with the first rinse or if there was some left behind. The process for the nasal swab experiments was very similar. Each nostril was swabbed with its own um, nasal swab, and it was about 20 seconds rotated along the septum. And then the two swabs were combined into the DI water and left for about 24 hours to allow the particles to kind of get off the swab before um, the swabs are removed. As described before, the internal section was rinsed and combined, and we rinsed the nose after collecting the nasal swabs to see if, again, any particulate was left behind. Um, the iron concentration was analyzed in all of the samples using ICP mass spec. So what we found based on the upstream and the downstream monitoring of particle, particle concentration that we were seeing most of the deposition occur in the five through 10 range. So here you can see the aerosol mass fraction for PM 0 0.5 to one micrometers, PM one through five micrometers and PM five through 10. So for the small size fraction, you're seeing that the downstream of the nasal cavity, these smaller particles make up a much larger fraction of the aerosol mass. Um, whereas for these larger particles, the downstream fraction is much smaller, approaching zero for the larger particles. And then in this one through five intermediate range, you're seeing some decrease downstream, but not anywhere near as drastic as these larger particles. Because of that, we decided to focus on um, the large particles for our analyses, as those are the ones that seem to be depositing. So we found that with nasal lavage, um, the nasal lavage did not very effectively collect mass. With each subsequent wash, we collected more particles <laughs> from the nasal cavity. So we went from about 223 nanograms on average in the first wash to 584 collected with the third wash. So we were not getting very efficient collection. And also we didn't see any associations with the amount of mass we collected with nasal lavage and upstream PM5 through 10 concentration. Um, we did find that the fraction depositing in the nose, which is the area accessible by the nasal swab, did show an association with the upstream PM5 through 10 concentration, but only at the higher airspeed. At the lower airspeed, there wasn't an association. Um, for nasal swabs, we found fairly effective collection of mass. So they collect an average of 455 nanograms, and the following rinse of the nose did not collect any mass or collected non-detectable amounts. And they also collected significantly more than was collected by the internal nasal cavity. And there's a somewhat indication of an association between the mass collected by nasal swab and the mass washed from the internal nasal cavity, but it's also fairly driven by this point up here. Um, but what was really cool to see was that the nasal swab mass was associated with upstream PM5 through 10 concentration. So you can see here we got a pretty decent linear fit. Um, has a significant p-value and a fairly decent r-squared. So in conclusion, we found that mass depositing in the nasal cavity as measured by nasal lavage appears to have a relatively poor relationship with external exposure and that it's not very efficient at collecting mass from the nasal cavity. So the mass recovered from each section increased with each subsequent wash and we didn't see any associations with the external exposure, like I mentioned. The nasal swabs show more promise for measuring environmental and occupational exposures. They seem to provide a link between internal and external PM levels and show an airspeed dependent relationship with external PM5 through 10. And they also appear to be associated with PM wash from the internal nasal cavity. So this assessment did have some limitations. This was a pilot study, so we had a relatively small number of experimental trials. So as you can see in a few of those graphs, it's unclear 
whether we're seeing a true association or we're just having this driven by a few points. So hopefully in the future, we can go back and do a few more experiments and see if the, all these relationships hold. And then also the nasal cavity model lacks a mouth. So nasal only breathing is seen only at rest or low activity levels. And we saw pretty low recovery in some samples. Um, there's also some fluctuation in the upstream particulate matter concentrations. As I mentioned, our aerosol generator had to be operated at its lowest generation rate, so it had a kind of hard time maintaining a consistent output. So uh, in conclusion, the collection of nasal swabs is rapid and relatively simple, and there are multiple potential applications. So my acknowledgments and some references in case anyone's interested. So thank you very much for your time and I will hand it off to the next speaker. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jomi. Um, th this is some pretty exciting work and um, if no one else does, when we're all done with the speakers, we'll have questions. And I've got a couple questions for you. This is uh, really timely work that you're doing. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's another one here too on, um, the work, uh, Jomi, um, on the nasal swab presentation. And uh, this is from Nate Netzer. And the question is, um, have you thought about or taken into consideration impact on hair follicles? Yeah, so sadly, our model does not have hair follicles. So we weren't able to account for that. We did use um, a substitute for nasal mucus or snot, depending on how formal you want to be. So we used a hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose compound that we added to the nasal cavity model before each experiment. So it wasn't just a completely dry, hard surface. There was some um, mucosal substitute in there. Thank you. It's, it's a bit of a challenge um, to get a model that's really um, uh, characteristic of, of the, of the uh, actual person. So it's a challenge. Um, I have one question myself around uh, the nasal sampling. Um, and with a lot of the work that we've done in the field um, over the years, we've tried some different types of swabs, but have ended up kind of going with the nasal rinse um, uh, just from pra practicalities in terms of the, of the field collection. Um, your work so far is, is uh, making me rethink that a little bit in terms of what we're doing. Um, but I know right now, one of the things we're dealing with uh, as long as, or as well as everybody else, is that um, you know, we have field studies that are on hold right now. Um, we're looking at getting back into the field and doing that work, but trying to think of ways to uh, make sure that um, our, our researchers and the workforces that we're involved with, that everybody's as safe as possible. So we're thinking about you know, what could we have people do themselves? Um, okay. And you know, just to put that out, that it's a um, you know very very timely uh, work that you're doing, and you know if if you based on your work so far, would you have a recommendation on uh, swab versus a, a nasal rinse or nasal lavage? Yeah. So based on what we were seeing, um, admittedly, like you said, there isn't a way to make this truly <laughs> a realistic to humans, but so we weren't able to like reflux the nasal lavage, for example, because you can't have a model like put its tongue in the back of its throat. So, um, but just with the rinsing that we were doing, we just weren't seeing very good recovery with the nasal lavage. We weren't capturing as much. And even after three rinses, um, we were still seeing increasing amounts. We weren't expecting it to still be increasing after three washes. So we didn't do any further ones. Um, but the swabs were really easy to collect and you could most definitely have someone self-collect a nasal swab because it is just like basically the external nose. It only goes up to about there. It's comfortable to do and it's quick. You could just have someone collect it and then like put it into a vial. And the swabs we were using um, were flopped swabs. So that was kind of that picture I showed. The fibers, once you put them in water, will all kind of like flow apart so that any trapped particles can um, 
spread out from the swab. So we were seeing like pretty good recovery from them. But as I mentioned, this is a pretty small pilot. So definitely need to do some more work on it, but yeah. shows promise. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's, we have a couple of other questions and one of them is also related to the nasal swab. So uh, maybe to do this one since you're live uh, on yeah. the screen here right now. Um, and it's, you mentioned you performed these studies after 15 minutes of exposure. And the question is, you know, could you speak to potential difficulties of translating this to workers that have different exposure times? Yeah, so that is a really good point. And that was why we stuck with the 15 minutes, just because based on the research we've done, 30 minutes is a pretty typical like clearance half-life for um, nasal particulate. So one thing we'd kind of brainstormed for if you could implement this in the field would maybe be like kind of pre-swab the worker so that you have an idea of like background and like clean the nose out a little bit. And then like after a specified time, collect another swab just because it is like fairly non-invasive. So that could be a way that you kind of get at that. Um, otherwise, yeah, you're right. Like the different exposure times is a little bit difficult to take into account. So that was kind of our idea to come up with like a baseline value, but. Okay, thank you. Um, 